Namu myoho renge kyo, namu myoho renge kyo, namu myoho renge kyo. Hi friends, I hope you're in good health today and uh, in good circumstance. Thank you for being here, thank you for your practice, and thank you for your support. If you're interested in uh, doing more uh, than liking and subscribing, which is essential to our YouTube algorithms, um, but financially, it takes a lot to keep all of these resources going. So there's several different ways, and and actually, uh, even if all you uh, all you do, even if what you do is uh, purchasing a, an ebook um, or print book or going to the bookstore or a, a proper mandala, um, you are helping to support this endeavor. So thank you. Thank you. All right. As we study Buddhism, uh, we often encounter terms that throw us for a loop. Where? What is that? What? I didn't read that in the other translations, right? Um, and uh, many of those terms, if not all, are tend to um, revolve around the history of Buddhism, and by that I mean not just historical words or words about the history, but words that define certain aspects of thinking uh, from pre-Buddhism, early Buddhism, and in, in, into the, you know, the five periods of Buddhism, um, and sometimes, of course, show up even in our study of the Mahayana, because that doesn't depend on Shakyamuni, or scholarship so much as it does the authors and the translators and their cultural uh, realities, right? Their biases. One of those terms, like we're going to discuss today, sarira, uh, doesn't come up very often, but with certain groups or certain translation societies or organizations uh, who are stuck in their own time warp of tradition and cultures, um, those early teachings, those early th thoughts, those early patterns of tradition, um, they still haven't let go of them. So, Sarira is uh, indicative of one of those aspects of the uh, cultures surrounding the teachings of Shakyamuni. Shakyamuni didn't talk about uh, what to do with his ashes when, after he died or his bones or his relics. Um, he always spoke more broadly about Buddha and Buddhism and Buddhahood and the actions one should take on one's path to enlightenment. Um, Sarira is one of those terms that predates Buddhism, and it's about relics. You know, all of the religions of the world have these weird ritualistic worshipping uh, habits about hanging on to the body. I mean, re religion is so uh, samsaric in that it's materialistic uh, as much as it wants to be fanciful, and I mean all religions, uh, magical, mystical, it's all referential to the body, right? That's why there's things like uh, reincarnation or afterlife or heaven and hell, like other places for your, quote, body to be. Even if you speak of a soul or, a, or an essence, you're really talking about a fanciful term for a stand-in, a proxy for uh, body. And in Buddhism, we talk about uh, that all the time. Well, we call it a self, this illusory idea of identity hmm? that we construct a self from. You know, and many would mistake that for the image in the mirror. There it is. There's the me. Um, when, uh, you know, this thumb, if you look at it closely enough, uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't have me in it. Focus, yeah, 
it's not going to focus. Anyway, oops, my lighting is pretty bad. There we go. Is that better? All right. So Sarira, Buddha's Sarira's refer to the cremated ashes of Buddha's bones as well as the remains of the coffin, the altar that was used for the cremation of Buddha when he passed away, passed away. That's not the language of Shakyamuni, is it? He said extinction. No more me. No, in fact, he said no more Tathagata. Obviously, that was an expedient device, trying even in his last moments to break people of this, uh, this that talons of craving and clinging to this bodily self. It's an illusion. It's a it's a carrier. It's a it's not even a vessel. It's a it's an idea of a vessel. It's the thing from which emerges a sentient mind. And for that, we're really thankful for this human body. That's why we look at this human body as such a tremendous opportunity because it's rare. You say, well, there's 8 billion people on the planet. It ain't that rare. Yeah, well, in the universe... In the entire cosmos, with all of its rocks flying around, incredible, innumerable stars, we can't even imagine how immense the cosmos is. Eight billion, it's a speck of dust on this little blue marble we call Earth. Hmm? So yeah, this is inconsequential. It's important, it's rare, and it's an opportunity we dare not waste. Because the whole purpose of this whole manifestation, how, whatever you believe in as far as evolution, however from the plasma of the great cosmos, we were able to instantiate a mechanism by which to emerge a sentient, self-aware mind? Well, that's the whole purpose of that mind, is to conceive of the incomprehensible in its simplicity, the engine of life. Isn't this amazing? Does that mean the engine of life has an ego and wants to be seen? No, it doesn't mean that. I mean, you could interpret it that way, but it seems kind of short-sighted. <laughs> what an immense thing to consider. That the reason you and I are having this discussion is to exercise our ability to conceive of the entire cosmos, the, the thing that makes it the thing, which is how we come to be. When you start looking at life at that scale, then all of the little dramas, anxieties, stress, that's broken. Can I, I don't have enough of those. What did she mean when she said that? <laughs> they seem so, they just, well, as soon as you focus on the, the magnificence, the, 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 just the sheer breath of life, all those things that you don't, it's not that they become small. It's that they don't even exist. They're, they're just weird little clingings in our mind. Shut up. Right? That's the whole point. There's nothing magical and mystical about Buddhism. It's about getting your mind right. Get your mind involved in the moment-to-moment -moment realization 
of the largesse of life and these little dramas that we cling to they're just they're just so unreasonable right that's what buddhism is about reason hmm. the dharma mind The term sarita, a word borrowed from Sanskrit, means the skeletal remains or body. The term sarita originally means body in Sanskrit. What did I say? And also refers to dead body, as in English. In Japan, Buddha's sarita is often used as a synonym for sarita. And the term sarita is used to distinguish the remains of others from those of the great sages or Buddha. So depending, it's a usage thing. Yeah? Also in the Mahayana, the greater vehicle or Buddha vehicle, Buddhism introduced from the north, Buddha's sariyas are interpreted as identical to Dharma body or Buddha nature. Wow, that's a twist, isn't it? Like, like there's some entity or thing called uh, Buddha nature or Buddha body. It's a moment-to-moment -moment thing, just like everything else. And I've talked about the three bodies of Buddha. It's in this book. We'll go over it again. It's coming up. Right? These are just ways of talking, putting words, language, fallible as it is, to try to capture Enlightenment, realization, insight. How do we talk about that happening, right? When it happens to you, when you're struggling and struggling with something to the point where you go, ah, I'll never figure it out. And then you have a good night's sleep and you get up in the morning and as you're eating your cereal or drinking your cup of coffee, boink, an answer just lays itself out in your mind. And, you go, and at first you might go, why am I thinking of that? Oh, that problem that I haven't been able to solve. Oh, it's not a problem. It's so, it's so, ah, aha, right? How do you put words to that? What's that like? What's happening there? This is why the verbiage in Buddhism can be a bit confounding. And it no less confounds those who come from perfectly honorable, we hope, means or, or intent to translate these words, which are words written down by others long after Shakyamuni expounded them in Prakrit, some forms of Prakrit. Hmm? How much local, traditional, educational, cultural bias is in all these different translations in myriad languages. So it's incumbent upon us, as Shakyamuni himself said, don't get hung up on the words. String them together enough to where a picture starts to form in your mind that you get those aha moments. There is the meaning. Not the words themselves. So, yeah, in a way, this Buddhism reference is a, a bit of a, a folly. But it's a guide. It's a guide to dis dismantling our adherence to specific words to try to encapsulate the concepts, the ideas, the, the nudges, the influences that the words are trying to to lead us to, and in a way very appropriate because each of us is going to get an insight, an aha moment constructed of our own experiences. So kind of, it's kind of elegant at the same time as it is frustrating. In Japan, it has been said that Buddhism was officially introduced into Japan either in 538 or in 552 and that um, 
Buddhist statues and sutras were brought over at the same time, but there was no description of sariras. That wasn't a, uh, a preoccupation of the Japanese culture, right? There is a description in the uh, Nihon Shoki, the Chronicles of Japan, that Buddha's sharidas were placed in the cornerstone of a pillar of, uh, or in uh, Hokoji Temple in January 15th, 593, an old lunar calendar, in 1956 as a result of an excavation of the area surrounded Asukadera Temple, an ancient foundation of Hokoji Temple, Ganjoji Temple, was found. A vessel for Buddha's sariras, placed in a wooden box, was found in a pillar foundation of the stupa, which no longer exists. The sariras were placed in the pillar foundation in 593. But the stupa was burned down in 1196 as a result of lightning. It is said that the following year the saridas were dug out, placed in a new vessel and a wooden box, and buried in the pillar foundation again. During the Asuka period, temples with outstanding stupa, such as Hokoji Temple, Ikaruga Dera Temple, now Horyuji Temple, Horyuji Temple, and the existing Shitenoji Temple were built whose stupa was dedica were dedicated to Buddha's sariras. There is a description in the Nihon Shoki that Buddhist statues, a golden stupa, and sariras were sent by Jipyong Wang of the Sila Kingdom in July 623 in old lunar calendar again. It is said that the Saridas were dedicated to Shitenoji Temple. Uh, now, if you're not familiar with the Sila Kingdom, we're talking about the Korean peninsula, right? The K Korean uh, kingdom. In Buddhism's early days, Buddhist doctrine was valued so statues were not created based on the Indian customs and religious observances. Therefore, Buddhist saridas were the only subjects of religious belief having a concrete shape, a body. However, when Buddhism was introduced into Japan, Buddhist statues existed from the beginning, so Buddha's saridas and stupa, which were dedicated to the saridas, were not necessarily at the center of Buddhist practices. They, they, they weren't conjoined anymore, right? While Jianzhen visited Japan with Buddha's Sariyas in 754, Kukai brought back a large number of Buddha's Sariyas with Shingon esoteric Buddhism in 806. Subsequently, reverence for Buddha's Sariyas was reignited in Japan, and people started to venerate not only saridas in stupas, but also in a vessel for Buddha's saridas within the building. Ah, these religious rituals, they just won't die. Because of the national seclusion of the Edo period and the anti-Buddhism movement of the Meiji period, Interactions with overseas countries broke off, but there were a few cases where Buddha Sariyas were given as a result of interactions with the countries of Theravada Buddhism, such as Sri Lanka and Thailand after 1900, at the end of the Meiji period. So, it's a little history about Sariyas. Um, it's, it's interesting to know this stuff as we study uh, if for no other reason than when we encounter, encounter the term, we can categorize it as some esoteric, outside the need to know of our modern Buddhist practice. So that's Sariyas, uh, basically a holdover of attachments to body, bodily form, even after cremation, the, the, the dust itself of uh, the ashes 
um, still seen as carrying some what? Some weight of religious presence? Come on. Buddhism is everything away from that. It's not about that at all. But, you know, if you identify that in any sect or group as, as something that uh, is very important to them, then you can be quite well assured that that is a religious practice, not a Buddhist practice. So, anyway, Sadi does. An interesting word, an interesting history, and this is why I say it's really a word of history of peoples rather than Buddhism itself. Yes? Namo myo renge kyo. Invoke your Buddha nature. Invoke tathagataness in your life. Yes? Take care of your health. Practice with strength and conviction. Slow down, savor your practice. Namu myoho renge kyo. Yeah? I deeply, deeply appreciate your study, your practice. Keep it going, and I will see you in the next one. Okay? All right. Bye for now. Namu myoho renge kyo. Hi, everyone. I hope you'll indulge me just a couple of moments here of your time to make a quick announcement. As you know, I've worked over decades and over the last decade building this channel with thousands of videos of uh, lessons and insights and instruction. And um, I have a website to, to match it with lots of free information. There's free podcasts. There's the bookstore. There's the mandala store. The whole mission here is to support your practice and build your confidence daily for manifesting your maximum potential, yes? In that regard, I decided recently to demonetize my videos because quite frankly, how can you pay attention and focus and be motivated to practice Buddhism when you're constantly being barraged by commercials? So no more. Right. Although it wasn't uh, because of the size of our Sangha and the way YouTube works now, it's not nearly as uh, supportive as it used to be. So uh, that's another reason to, why why bother, right? But YouTube has come up with another way uh, to help support, and I thought I would give it a try and see if it uh, it's not obtrusive and see if. Um, you guys would uh, participate or enjoy this avenue towards supporting uh, the Sangha and all these resources. And that is a join button. And so you'll see that really soon. It'll pop up. And when you join, there's four different levels of joining, whatever. And, uh, you know, by simply being here, you're a part of the Sangha. Uh, the, you don't have to pay a membership fee or any of that. This is just an option. And as a thank you for uh, committing to a, a, a donation, a, a regular donation, uh, I will send you a PDF copy of, depending on the level, one, two, three, five books. Uh, and that could include a, um, a, a TIFF or a PDF high resolution of uh, a Nichiren inscribed mandala. Um, but also the liturgy, the Gongo book, mm -hmm. uh, Buddhism reference, uh, my uh, annotated uh, Threefold Lotus Dharma Sutra book. Um, they're all listed in the joint. So take a look, take a moment, click the button and see what's on offer. And if it works for you, um, yeah, we would be eternally grateful, eternally. We would be very grateful uh, for the support. Uh, to keep things going here, okay? That's all I wanted to say. Uh, and uh, thank you, as always, for your support, just being here, liking and subscribing. And if you're already buying ebooks and purchasing other books, uh, it, it, you're, you're part of the Sangha and you're supporting. So thank you for that, right? But look for that join button, right? Um, just check it out, see if it works for you. Uh, if I don't get much action on it, well, I'll discontinue it. But... Um, at least it's not interrupting every darn video, is it? 
So, <laughs> so it's just another way for you to participate in keeping us afloat. Thanks again. Namo Myoren Gekyo. Enjoy the video.